Republicans like to talk a lot about the left's attacks on free speech and cancel culture. But remember that time the Trump White House said a TV host should be sacked, you know, canceled because of something she said that they didn't like? In September 2017, Jamel Hill, then a co-host of ESPN Sports Center, put out a series of tweets calling Donald Trump a white supremacist who surrounded himself with other white supremacists, adding, Trump is the most ignorant, offensive president of my lifetime. His rise is a direct result of white supremacy, period. Five years later, that sentiment has become kind of widespread, not that controversial anymore. At the time, though, people freaked out. ESPN, her employer, issued a statement clarifying that Jamel's views didn't represent the networks. They called her actions, quote, inappropriate. And then this is what the White House said about it. I think that's one of the more outrageous comments that anyone could make, uh, and certainly something that I think is a fireable offense by ESPN. A fireable offense for criticizing the president in a democracy where free speech is touted as sacred, especially by the right. Yet Trump himself began criticizing Jamel Hill. A month later, he tweeted, with Jamel Hill at the mic, it's no wonder ESPN ratings have tanked. In fact, tanked so badly, it's the talk of the industry. The event changed Jamel's life, as she said in a recent interview. From there, the escalation of hate mail and death threats to the point that the FBI was involved, and I had to think about getting security. Folders full of hate mail called me every racial slur in the book. Since that moment, Hill has only become more outspoken and more political. But she wants you to understand her backstory, too. And she's out with a memoir that's just come out called Uphill. And already The New York Times has called it one of the best memoirs to read this fall. Jamel Hill is also a contributing writer at The Atlantic and the host of the podcast Jamel Hill is Unbothered. Jamel Hill, thanks so much for joining me on the show. Um, let's start with that incident with Trump in 2017 when you called him a white supremacist and then started getting called out by the White House itself. You talk about it in the book. Where were you when you heard what was happening, when you heard the response from the White House? How did you feel at that moment? Uh, I was actually at ESPN when I heard about Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the then former press secretary, saying in a White House press briefing that what I said about the president was a fireable offense. So I was putting together, um, me and my co-host, we were putting together our nightly uh, edition of Sports Center, and uh, friends of mine who are political reporters who were actually in the room at the time, they started texting me and saying, hey, um, you know, the White House press secretary just called you out and just said you should be fired. And I was just really flabbergasted because, um, you know, you just never expect something to rise to the level of it being considered to be something to be brought up in front of a White House press briefing. You would think that they would have more concerning things or, you know, more important things to, to respond to. But, you know, as they say, a, a hit dog will holler. <laughs> yes, indeed. And you'd say in the book, Trump tweeting about me, you say, blew up my life. What was that like? Explain. A lot of viewers, they see Trump fighting with people online, calling people out. They don't see what happens afterwards, the death threats, the intimidation, the craziness. What was that like? Well, it, it changed my life in, in a lot of ways because even though I was on TV every night doing Sports Center, I was still able to operate in a bubble of safety. Uh, yes, people recognized me and came up to me all the time, but I never worried about any of those interactions. Of course, everyone knows that Donald Trump, because of his persona, because of the language he uses, because of the way and the bigoted way that he often talks about people, that he inspires and stokes an entirely different element of hatred. And that hatred, if you criticize him, is directed towards you. So, you know, numerous death threats. I mean, I had to have my voicemail at ESPN just completely cut off because the messages were so nasty. You know, his supporters wow. were calling and bar uh, barraging ESPN switchboards, you know, asking for me to be fired. It was just constant, nonstop, over and over. And yes, I was very concerned about my public safety. And in fact, as I write about in the memoir, the first place I went to after this all happened, I had to make sure that I had personal security because I was going to uh, a Giants um, Detroit Lions game that was in uh, New York on Monday Night Football. Yeah, I mean, having to pay for your insecurity, having to organize your insecurity, it's just not something that should happen in 2022. Uh, but it is happening all too often, given the threats and the violence. You mentioned the memoir. Let's talk about the memoir. Why did you want to write this memoir and write it now? Because you've become quite a prominent figure in our social political discourse. Did you feel that there was a part of you that was missing from people's understanding of who you are and where you're coming from? 
I did. I mean, I think, of course, people see you in this particular space and they only think of you as being, you know, someone who hosts, you know, their their favorite news and talk show or in my case, their favorite sports show or just, just we're identified and defined by the things that we do. But I had a whole other life that was very different than the one that I'm leading now. And I wanted people to understand the adversity I came from, the obstacles I had to overcome. And also for them to apply to their own lives in terms of your circumstances do not have to dictate the future and the life that you see for yourself. So you have become, I think it's fair to say, more political, more outspoken on politics, not just sport in recent years. What do you make of what's going on in the country right now? We are days away from midterm elections. When you're asked by people how big a deal do you think this is, what do you say to them? <laughs> You know, I know people are thinking that when I say it or even when you say it, that this is just being a hyperbole. But literally, these last few elections have completely been about the fate of our democracy. It is on the brink, if not in many cases, or in, in, some would argue that it's something that has already slipped away from us. We have to vote, vote hard, vote consistently, and not be frustrated by some of the results that we may see. Uh, at this point, you know, you have— a very distinct differences between the two parties. You have one that still believes in democracy and the other one who does not, who wants to shut down democracy and really wants to usher in a state of authoritarianism. You have one group that supports people storming the Capitol and trying to um, actively disrupt uh, an election and to essentially stage a coup. And uh, people need to understand that if you want all the other things that are uh, contingent upon us and live in productive lives in this country, it all hinges on whether or not we have a functioning democracy. And so I, people, I hope people understand that beyond the economy, other uh, issues that I know are important to a lot of Americans, important to me as well. But all those things you want to happen to the economy won't happen if you take the first step in the process, which is to understand what's exactly on the line. It's something far greater in the economy um, and even and some of the other issues that I know people um, are very, um, you know, feel very strongly about. And in your book, uh, you talk about a high school mentor of yours who you're quite close to, a journalist named Neil Shine. And you write, sometimes I wouldn't leave his office for hours, absorbing all of his stories and learning how critical journalism was to a functioning democracy and the significant responsibility placed on journalists' shoulders. He really believed it was a journalist's job to be the watchdog of society and that our loyalty should be to great journalism. Do you think our industry has lived up to that in recent years, especially in the wake of the rise of Trump and far-right extremism? No, we have not risen to the moment at all. I don't think we've done a good job of explaining to people what's at stake. Uh, I think we've done a really poor job of, you know, just framing what things mean. Part of it is some of us have been hiding behind this cloak of ob objectivity and of both sidesisms. Uh, you know, everything doesn't need both sides. Some things are just pretty clear and cut and dry, and it's okay that we call them that. I think our jobs as journalists is to be fair. Fair is different than objective, because a watchdog yes. is not objective. A watchdog, by its nature, is somebody who is looking to hold the powers that be, those in position and power, authority figures, accountable for how they treat or mistreat the public. So let's talk about social media. That's where you and I spend a lot of our time, for good or ill. Uh, Elon Musk has taken over Twitter in recent days. Uh, his first day, according to one study from the Network Contagion Research Institute, saw a 500 percent rise in the use of the N-word across that platform, which prompted LeBron James and other prominent black figures to call him out. In recent days, in fact, in the last 24 hours, he's announced a plan to bring in $8 monthly fee for blue check accounts, uh, which will have all sorts of issues in terms of uh, uh, verification status and public figures and threats. So what do you make of Musk's takeover of Twitter? And are you going to be paying 8 bucks a month, Jamal? Uh, I'm not putting a dime into Elon, Musk, M Elon Musk's pocket. Uh, listen, it's, um, I know by indirectly... I am doing that by using the platform, but I'm not going to pay for a blue check. And I think what we're going to see is somebody who started off wanting to buy Twitter as a vanity project and as a way for him to thumb the system, maybe even put a middle finger to the system, if you will. And I think the problems on Twitter are far greater than um, he even understands and 
his influence on the platform, I think, will be largely negative. People don't, you know, part of what makes people want to spend money is you got to feel good about spending your money. And I don't think a lot of people, yes. or I think it's a huge amount of people who do not feel good about giving Elon Musk their money. So, you know, especially to people like LeBron James, other black celebrities, and frankly, black Twitter, period, which to me is the foundation for Twitter. If they are feeling unsafe, disrespected by who he is and certainly the some of the things that he has done not necessarily with twitter but just some of the things that are in his past then this does not seem yeah. like a winning proposition for him last quick question before i let you go i've got to ask about Brittany griner who's been uh, in russia since february detained since february now serving a nine and a half year prison sentence it's widely seen as a political move by the russian government the u.s there's been talks about the u.s getting her out negotiating a release an exchange hasn't happened yet her lawyer told the times that she's concerned she will have to see out this almost decade long sentence a question that's been asked by a lot of people if she was lebron james would we have the same silence and lack of coverage here in the U.S.? Well, I don't know if um, it does her any service by comparing her to LeBron James. I mean, to be honest, if it was LeBron James, they probably never would have captured him. And I think part of this is not just about comparing her to other male players and making it seem as if um, the inability to get her out is strictly hinged on on her celebrity or on some uh, in some estimation, lack thereof. I think this is a very complicated international issue. I think the Russians seized an opportunity, uh, despite the fact that she's won multiple championships for that country. The hatred of the United States is certainly playing a role in this and wanting to show, um, you know, kind of show the United States up. I remain hopeful. I think the best way that we can continue to um, keep pressure on our own government to negotiate her release is by doing what you did, which is asking me a question about Brittany Griner. We can't afford to forget about her and because she's done too much for yeah. this country. Um, and she just does not deserve the treatment she's received. And as a queer woman in that country that has very strong homophobic views, I think we yeah. really need to be concerned about her safety and her release needs to be a top priority for our government. I think you make an interesting point about the comparison with LeBron. The reason I raise it is we've had black women guests on the show who have raised the idea that her sexuality, her gender, and her race is part of this. But I appreciate oh, your answer. Listen, there's, there's no question that those things are factors into even the response from the American public not being very sympathetic. And I think yes, that's a problem. That's what I was getting. In general, at. it doesn't. We, yeah, it doesn't even need to be compared to, to LeBron James. Is that I just think there's just a lack of empathy for black women in general.